Eva é a única que pode ser. A Eva é a única que se não, não faço isso agora. Não faço isso agora. Não faço isso agora. Não faço isso agora. Pleasure to have Professor Marian Backerman here with us. It's her second time here in ISPA uh, for conferences, but uh, and it's also a big pleasure because Professor Marian is now a professor here at ISPA. So I have to introduce you as <laughs> a professor at ISPA. It's a big, big pleasure to have her here. Professor Marian is one of the um, most important uh, researchers in the field of uh, developmental psychology and specifically around uh, the topics of uh, early child relationships and their impact on the development. And she also did a very important work on uh, uh, the relationship between uh, development and more biological uh, uh, measures. I could speak about your work all day, but I don't think it's that's the topic that uh, we are here today to discuss. We are here today to hear your work. A very important work. Let me just say also that it's also a pleasure and an honor because uh, you, Professor Marion is one of the uh, 176 people that are on the top 1% of the most highly cited <laughs> researchers in the field of psychology and psychiatry. There, and so it's uh, really a pleasure um, to, um, to have you here. Uh, I think we all very. Um, anxious to um, uh, hear you, so I'll let you uh, present your work and then in the, in the end we'll probably have some time to uh, discuss and make some questions and comments. So please, it's an honor. Thank you, Mariela, for your kind introduction. The pleasure is actually mine. I'm very happy to be here and I'm, be, I'm proud to be part of this team now and that you are my, my colleagues, my students, and we always uh, feel always free to approach me if you have any question, either about your own work or about what I'm going to present. Um, that's, that would really be great. Okay, today, move to tears, neuron behavioral responses to infants crying and, uh, and laughter. 
for we do know that caregivers can respond in various ways to infants crying. They can be moved to tears themselves, and is that helpful or not? Or they can be completely indifferent. And if they are touched by the tears of their infants, they can respond either in a, in a rather harsh way or in a sensitive way. And today we're going, uh, going to look a bit at crying, the phenomenon of crying, normal cry curves, but also to responses to crying and uh, see what affects those responses. So the topics that I, I'd like to, uh, to discuss today is the normal crying curve, attachment and neural reactivity to crying, maltreatment, neurobiology, genetics, brain and hormones that play a role in responses to crying, and then end on a, on a better note, laughter. Unfortunately, it takes uh, six weeks before infants begin to, to smile, to show laughter. The first six weeks after birth, it's, it's only crying that they can do to communicate their, uh, their feelings to their parents or other care, uh, caregivers. So crying, smiling and babbling are infant behaviors that mediate attachment, the relationship between the parent and the, the child. There are social signals with the predictable outcome of increased proximity of the parent to the child. And that is why it's also uh, evolutionary functional. A baby can't do anything for himself. He can't take care of himself. So he needs the caregivers. And the only means that he has to bring the caregivers to him is crying. So actually, one of the first questions that a journalist asked me yesterday is, why do we cry? Well, it's necessary for survival. That's why we cry. And actually, Darwin was also highly interested in, in crying. And this is uh, from his book, The Expression of the Emotions in Men and Animals, that he wrote um, directly after On the Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. So it was really in the heart of his interest. Crying and also laughter are evolutionary important behaviors we inherited these behaviors because they help us survive and relate to other people. Now we think of the animal world, uh, we talk about crocodile tears and elephant cries, but actually uh, when we distinguish between three types of crying, the basal cry that, that is good for lubrication of our eyes, the reflex cry if you cut onions, and the emotional cry, then the emotional cry is unique for humans and it, it develops over time. Infants cry loud, but newborns cry without tears, and adults mostly cry quietly, but with tears. So it makes quite a difference what the age of the other person is that you see crying, whether you see many tears or whether you hear many sounds. In one of the studies that we did, we tested the effects of seeing tears on the faces of infants and adults with otherwise more or less neutral faces. So in the MRI machine, we exposed adults to infant and adult faces with and without tears. And it turned out that baby tears trigger more brain activity than adult tears. You see here in the upper half the difference between infant faces with tears and infant fa faces without tears. The tears, we made them, in, we brought them in into the pictures, we put them on the pictures. So it was the same face, but we added tears. And on the lower half, you see the brain responses, adult face with tears compared to adult face without tears. And you see in the upper half, there are many more regions that are red or yellow, so show more activity in that comparison. So, particularly in the somatosensoric pain regions, for instance, the precuneus and the IFG, we respond stronger to infant tears than we do to adult tears. We are more touched by infant crying. And that might also have good reasons. Um, and that may have to do with the following picture. This is what I got when I googled uh, crying infant. And uh, if you then select uh, pictures, this is what you get. And now what struck me is, 
virtually all of these babies, <coughs> except the one in the lower left corner, had their eyes closed. You see almost no eyes. And now if you think back about what moves us in babies, why we think infants are attractive, is because they have such big eyes. So in a way, crying, which makes their eyes invisible, um, is a risk for, it's less attractive. These, these baby faces are not what we, what we consider the most attractive or nice baby faces in the world. Um, we can't see their eyes. And then, uh, if we combine that with uh, the sound that they make, <coughs> eliciting some aversion. Um, why do we cry then? Well, why do babies cry? Because it's also informative about their state. Let's listen to the next cry. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> what do you think of this second cry compared to the first? How do you experience it as a listener? It's different. I think the, fir the first crying, I think, was more um, suffering. It shows more suffering, I think. The first more suffering? Mm -hmm. The second? Mm -hmm. Does one of the cry sounds uh, alert you more? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Which one? Second. The second. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's great, actually. What, what it is the same cry sound but we uh, electronically increase the pitch. So it's mm -hmm. crying at a higher pitch. Mm -hmm. And now babies who are sick or barely in need or are, are have neurological conditions, they cry at a higher pitch. So, and you, you all felt that. It was more urgent, that higher mm -hmm. pitch. Mm -hmm. Now what's interesting is that parents with postnatal depression have more difficulty distinguishing between the two types of cry sounds, which means that they are less ready to respond to crying that is urgent. So that probably means that the optimal level of arousal in the caregiver when listening to infant crying is in the middle. It's no good if, you, if you're not touched at all, if you're indifferent to crying, but it's also not good if you're overwhelmed for them, you can't do anything anymore. <coughs> so the optimum level is probably in the middle. So what do we know about infant crying? It's eliciting care, it promotes proximity seeking, it's evolutionary adaptive, it gives information on health condition, but it also elicits aversion. We don't like the, the, the sound of infant crying. And by the time that infants are around six months of age, almost 6% of the parents admit that they have been smothering, slapping, or shaking the baby. And that is what you also see in the next graph which is the number of cases for shaken baby syndrome brought into California hospitals in a certain period against the age of the babies. And you see the age in weeks <coughs> at a peak, and you see that even better on the next slide, a peak at around um, 10 weeks, 10, 12 weeks. And now the, the infant cry curve, the typical curve of infant crying, babies have a cry peak at around two months of age. So that converges with the incidence of shaken baby syndrome. What you see here is that it is uh, a specious wide, so to say, cry peak uh, around eight months, but you also see the huge difference between babies. Some cry as little as 20 minutes per day, some cry as much as six hours per day, and that is <coughs> immense. 
Now, you may wonder, does that depend on, uh, on what you do with babies? Are babies who are lonely in their cribs, do they cry more or less than babies that are always in physical contact with their parents, for instance, in, uh, in, on, the, on the African continent? And there's been some studies, some older studies done on that, and that show that the duration for infants crying is lower. You see that in the table here, and this is an older paper, so you see it's still a bit... Uh, primitive, we would say, in, uh, in the layout, uh, we see a lower duration of crying, but the same frequency of crying. So the numbers of, of cries per hour is not different, whether in Western industrialized countries or in countries where the baby is constantly in close physical proximity. The duration is less, but the frequency is the same. So indeed, this is a universal phenomenon. It does matter something, uh, it does matter what you, what you do. And this is an Israeli study um, on responses to infant crying during the night, in particular for parents who with, with infants who have sleep problems. So we don't sleep through the night, we cry a lot during the night. And that group of parents, as well as a group of control parents, as well as a group of childless couples, watched videos of a crying infant and were asked when they would intervene. And the clinical group, the parents with a child with sleeping problems, had a lower tolerance for crying. They, would, they reported that they would, sooner, they would sooner intervene with the baby. Uh, and that might actually not help to solve the infant crying problem, the sleep problem, but uh, add to it. Moreover, when they read vignettes about infant crying during the night, the parents with a child with sleeping problems attributed more distress to these vignettes. So they thought the cry of the child indicated something that was more serious than the other parents did. In sum, normal crying curve peaks around two months. There are huge individual differences in crying. The cry curve for cry frequency is universal, but cry duration might be briefer with physical contact. And parental over-arousal may increase crying and might increase sleep problems. We move on to the, the second topic, attachment and neuroreactivity to crying. Attachment, perhaps well known to, to all or most of you, is uh, attachment behavior is shown <coughs> by children in times of distress when they seek contact and proximity. The goal is uh, comfort and protection. It does has an evolutionary base. It helps survive in the first years. And we talk not about more or less attachment, but about differences in quality of attachment. And those differences in the quality of attachment can be measured with, for instance, the attachment Q sort for, uh, for, for toddlers. But for really young children, around 12 months of age, usually the strain situation is used. And that is an observation procedure where children and their caregivers are brought into an unfamiliar room and the caregiver leaves the room <coughs> two times. That is stressful for a child. Thus it elicits attachment behavior. And what is telling you most about the pattern of attachment is what a child does at the reunion with the caregiver. So what behavior shows the child once the parent comes in after a brief separation? And then children show different patterns. Some strike the balance between seeking comfort with the parent and then exploring the environment again and that's about 65% of the children. Some focus on the environment. They do not seek comfort with the caregiver, and they seem undisturbed by the separation. But from physiological measures, we do know that they are impressed by being alone in an unfamiliar environment. But they do not, sh not show proximity behavior. They do not show that they are distressed to the caregiver. They're minimizing attachment behavior, and that is true of around 20-25% of the infants. 
And then there, there is a group of children for whom the balance is to the other side. They focus completely on the attachment figure. Uh, they are not really comforted by contact with the attachment figure. Um, and there is no exploration at all in the remaining uh, of the procedure. And there's a fourth category, disorganized attachment, um, that it can be given in addition to these three classifications if a child also shows disorganized or fearful behavior in response to the reunion. Now, in attachment behavior, responsiveness to infant crying has, uh, has played a big role. It was predicted to, um, to be correlated with secure attachment, so the more responsiveness a parent showed, the better the chance that a child would be securely attached. But one step further, perhaps, is the uh, conclusion of Bell and Ainsworth that responsiveness to infant crying reduces infant crying. And responsiveness means the promptness of the response. So if a child cries, respond immediately. And that was directly counter to learning theory, uh, which said that a child that would receive an immediate response to crying would cry more, for it's, it's nice to have response. So this conclusion was based on the Baltimore study. The single most important factor associated with a decrease in frequency and duration of crying is the promptness with which a mother responds to cries. This study has been cited more than 450 times and also in popular parenting literature, but we should realize that it included only 23 children. So it was a small study with intensive observations. And even in the obituary in the New York Times when uh, uh, Mary Angel passed away, this was seen as her most important contribution. Though much of Dr. Ainsworth's research was for an academic audience, it also had a practical side. She argued on the basis of her research that picking up a crying baby does not spoil the child, rather it reduces crying in the future. And now there have been only few replication studies, and I think the, the, the most thorough one of those did not replicate Ainsworth's findings. So here for duration, when responsivity and crying was measured in the, in, um, the first months of the, the infant's life, um, Hubbard and Van Eisendorn found that indeed unresponsiveness increased crying, but also the other way around, crying increased in responsiveness. And these values were in, in the same range, not very different. And actually, unresponsiveness decreased the frequency. So the first two figures were for duration, here for frequency. And responsiveness decreased the frequency of cry sounds in the next trimester. So it may be more important to distinguish between different cry sounds and re respond accordingly. So distinguish um, crying that is about to, to, to finish in and of itself, for instance, in a tired infant, from urgent crying that needs a response. That is also suggested by studies on infant sleep problems. If you respond to every cry indifferently, you may help to, uh, to continue the sleep problems of an infant. OK, so far about uh, attachment relationship of the child to the parent. Now, attachment can also be measured in adults. And the gold standard is the adult attachment interview. An interview with questions about childhood experiences and their influence on an adult's personality and how he or she thinks she is as a parent. It includes questions for general descriptors of childhood attachment relationships, separate for the mother and for the father, and then concrete evidence for, from attachment-related experience. So you say that your mother were, was patient with you in the first 12 years of your life. Could you give me a, an example of when your mother was patient? And then evaluation of the effects of early uh, caregiving experience on current, current personality, 
questions about traumatic events and about the current relationship with the parents. And the adult attachment interview leads to classifications that are based on uh, how coherent the interview is. So not about the real experiences that parents tell you, that adults tell you, but about how they talk about those experiences, when, when whether they adhere to crisis, uh, the language philosopher Christ, crisis maxims of quality, quantity, relevance and manner. And a secure adult is uh, able to show in his interview open but contained communication about emotions. So remember the child classifications with either a focus on environment or on the at attachment figure uh, or secure children striking the balance between those two. We see the same patterns in adults. So those who are called dismissing are minimizing attachment. They say it was not so important. I focus on the environment, I focus on the future. Those who are overwhelmed are still very much involved with their parents, with their past. They're still angry or still passively doing what their parents expect from them. They have no time to explore in the environment. Uh, and secures are open to both. They are not angry anymore, but they are open also about negative experiences. They, um, they are coherent in their reports about the past and the influence of the past on the present. And there's an additional classification, unresolved, for those who still struggle with either the loss of a, of a dear one or with traumatic experiences. And that is the, the adult analog to disorganized attachment in children. Okay, that's in a nutshell, adult attachment. And we measured whether adult attachment is associated with responses to infant crying. And we did that using an MRI machine. Um, and we measured the attachment representations with the adult attachment interview. Now, in the fMRI machine, we exposed the participants to infant cry sounds at 500 and 700 hertz. Those are the cry sounds that you just heard, the normal crying and the increased pitch crying. And what you always need in an fMRI paradigm is a control condition that is quite similar, but not really the same. So here you need a control sound, and what we used as a control sound is the following sound, and I'll explain in a minute how we made it. It is matched on acoustic characteristics, and we reached that, we achieved that, by cutting the cry sound in thousand pieces, reordering them, and then this was the control sound. So it is definitely a noise, but it's not crying. The emotional meaning is taken away from, from the sound. And what we found was that those adults with an insecure attachment representation showed more amygdala uh, activation in response to the cry sounds compared to the control sounds. And amygdala activation is related to anxiety, aversion, and arousal, mostly negative uh, feelings. And that was true, you see here, for all types of insecure. F3 is the secure adults, and the other three are the three insecure classifications, dismissing, preoccupied, and unresolved. Moreover, once they were out of the machine, we exposed them again to the cry sounds and asked them to report on their feelings, feelings of irritation <coughs> to, while listening to the cry sound. And also did a test with a hand grip dynamometer. A hand grip dynamometer, you may know if you go to a gym, um, you can squeeze it, and that's good for training your hands. But in our study, we ask adults to, to squeeze the hand grip dynamometer and then the second time to squeeze it at half strength. And they can see on a screen how much uh, force they used in the first squeeze and then 
um, uh, modulate in their second squeeze the strength to half of the first. So they can train until they can do that. And then we turn the screen away and we ask them to do the same. So squeeze maximum strength, squeeze half strength. But now when listening to infant laughter sounds and infant cry sounds. And this is what we found. Those adults who had an insecure attachment representation reported to be more irritated by uh, the infant cry sounds and also more often used excessive force. So they were not able to modulate their second squeeze to half of the strength of the first squeeze. It's of course not an absolute using more strength for people <coughs> uh, differ hugely in how much force they have in their, in their hands. So that's why everyone sets his own baseline of full strength and is then asked to modulate the strength to half, uh, half the, the force of the first one. And those who were insecure had much more difficulty modulating their force when exposed to infant cry sounds. So in sum about this part, the Baltimore study, Mary Ainsworth, suggested an immediate response to all crying works best, and that study was influential, but not replicable. Insecure attachment leads to strong responses, strong reactions to crying, more amygdala reactivity, more irritation, and stronger hand grip. Now the, the bridge to, the, to maltreatment is perhaps not so big because the hand grip by nanometer has also been used in samples um, uh, at risk for maltreatment and um, maltreating parents have indeed difficulty modulating their power in the interaction with their infants uh, and also in the uh, interaction in, in using the uh, uh, hand grip nanometer as we will see. Why is maltreating, maltreatment also a topic to discuss in the context of infant crying? Because in a prevalence study that we did in the Netherlands, we found that being a child, being between zero and three years of age, increases the chances to be, maybe you have another good side if you're <coughs> increases the chance to be the victim of child maltreatment. Um, if we if we take into account the population of children between 0 and 18 years in this specific year in the Netherlands, 21% of that population is aged 0 to 3 years. But in the population of maltreated children, the group of children in the age range from 0 to 3 years is 41%. So there is a risk ratio that is much increased for younger children. Apparently, it's a risk for maltreatment to be young. And that might have to do with crying. We measured in a, in a group of maltreating mothers and in a comparison group of non-maltreating mothers <coughs> who also went to a therapy setting, but then for reasons that were child-related, uh, how they responded to crying. We used again the uh, head grip nanometer, had them do it at baseline during exposure to infant laughter and exposure to infant crying. And we asked them to squeeze at maximum strength and to squeeze at half strength. And what we found was that they responded with more force to both infant crying and laughter when they were in the maltreatment group. They used more often excessive force for those mums who, um, who committed physical abuse, but also those who were neglectful. Now such a study has always has a problem, and this study has that problem too, that there is quite high comorbidity. So often maltreatment combines both neglect and uh, physical abuse. We also measure their physiological reactivity to infant crying. Uh, by taking salivary uh, alpha amylase uh, when exposed to bouts of infant crying. 
and salivary alpha-amylase is produced by salivary glands in the mouth for digestion and it can also be used as an indirect non-invasive measure for activity of the sympathetic nervous system and it's an immediate stress response. You probably know the stress uh, hormone cortisol which is quite often used but is a, is a much later uh, response uh, that can be measured around 20 minutes. This is more direct. It's expected to respond 10 seconds already after the stressor. And what we found was that maltreating mothers had a lower level of salivary alpha amylase, but also a much flatter response during exposure to bouts of infant crying. And the same was true, a flatter response in their skin conductance. Moreover, there was a dissociation between heart rate and pre-ejection period in maltreating mothers. What you normally expect to find is here in the green uh, blocks for the normal treating mothers that heart rate and pre-ejection period are negatively correlated. But that was absent in the maltreating mothers. So there is dysregulation of their physiological processes when they are exposed to, to infant crying, which might be the result of their own childhood experiences. In the group of maltreating mothers, there was a much higher percentage of mothers that had been the victim of child maltreatment in their own youth compared to the non-maltreating non mothers. In sum, infant crying is a risk for maltreatment. Maltreating parents show dysregulated physiological responses to infant crying that may be related to their own childhood. Turning to neurobiology, genetics, brain and hormones. What is their role in uh, predicting responses to infant crying? Um, <coughs> in one of our early studies, we measured responses to infant <coughs> crying here, uh, heart rate, in uh, adult twins, males and females, monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And uh, the, the thing about twin studies is that you can derive heritability of, uh, of, of here prior responses from how similar they are. If monozygotic twins are in the response to infant crying much more similar to each other within the pair than dizygotic or fraternal twins, then apparently it, dif it makes a difference, it matters whether your structural DNA is the same as in monozygotic twins or not the same as in dizygotic twins. Dizygotic twins, just like um, normal siblings, share 50% of the structural DNA, whereas monozygotic twins share 100% of the structural DNA. If they respond in a similar way, uh, si with similar similarity, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, then apparently it doesn't matter so much whether you are genetically identical or not. So then the heritability figures go down. Here we found quite some heritability um, and the same heritable, heritability factor played a role both in heart rate baseline and in responsivity to uh, uh, reactivity to, to infant cry sounds. Importantly, it is not true that males responded less than females. So maybe you have the same experience as I have if I sit on a birthday party and I have young parents. Um, in many cases they tell me, yeah, the father doesn't hear the cry and he doesn't respond to it. Well, their hearts do. <laughs> so um, give them the room to respond for the males showed even more heart rate responsivity and reactivity to the infant cry sounds than the females. What happens in the brain when we're exposed to, to infant crying? Uh, a lot. You see here all the regions that are uh, active, activated when we compare responses to infant cry sounds with responses to infant to uh, control sounds. What we did here was that we combined raw data from various studies. MRI studies usually cannot be uh, 350 
participants for it's quite expensive and intensive. So here we were able to combine the data of uh, various studies that were done uh, to um, responsiveness to crying, to neural, re neural uh, dealing with, with cry sounds. And it made it also possible to compare between parents and non-parents, between males and females. And what we found was that males, controlling for parenthood, showed more activation in the right IFG, the temporal pole, and the left angular gyrus. And those are brain regions that are related to mentalizing and semantic processing. While females, controlling for parenthood, showed more activation in the insula somatosensory cortex that are related to emotional processing. And if you do the analysis the other way around, so look what happens if we compare parents compared to non-parents controlling for their gender, we see that the parents also move, show more activation in emotional processing. So you could say roughly that if men becomes father, become fathers, there is a change from more mentalizing activity to more emotional processing. And for details, you refer to, to this paper. And that uh, may make you wonder, or perhaps I should say, I would like to alert you to um, the idea that we tend to think that there is something in our brain that affects what we are doing, but it could actually be the other way around. What we do affects our brains. So perhaps that is why fathers move, um, change in their neural processes when they are uh, exposed to infants crying. And some uh, suggestive support for that idea is found in the Israeli study on gay couples where they compared primary caregiving fathers' amygdala activation with those of the mothers in the heterosexual couples. And indeed, primary caregiving fathers' amygdala activation was similarly, similar to primary caregiving mothers. And for all fathers was found that time spent in direct childcare was related to amygdala superior temporal sulcus connectivity. So it may be more important what fathers do than what they are, whether they are actively involved in childcare than whether they are fathers or not. And that is what we also found in our study, where a series of studies uh, on men in the transition to fatherhood, we did not find any difference in resting state functional connectivity between expectant and new fathers. Upper hall for expectant fathers, lower hall for new fathers, very similar. But what we do, did find was an effect of how much there were the new fathers were um, involved in daily child care. <coughs> there was greater connectivity between right amygdala and regions <coughs> that are part of the so-called parental brain in fathers who spent more hours in direct child care. So our brains are adaptive to what we do. It doesn't matter what you are, whether you're a father or not, it matters what you do. And maybe that's not so strange if we think about dancers and ourselves, uh, myself, if we are exposed to music, the brains of dancers respond differently than my brain. And that is because of their experience with, with music. Well, maybe the, the, the difference between music and baby crying <laughs> is observable, but it might work the same way. Then, in terms of uh, hormones, oxytocin is the typical love hormone or parenting hormone. Um, it sharpens emotion recognition, it lowers aversion, it elevates empathy, so it might lead to more sensitivity. And that's what indeed what we found in the first study in fathers with toddlers uh, with ASD, uh, autism spectrum disorder, and without them, that fathers after a sniff of oxytocin were more sensitive in the interaction with uh, children. But how about responsivity to infants crying? We um, 
um, had a, did an experiment with oxytocin administration, and this was not a within subject design, but a between subject design. This was our first fMRI study, and we thought it would be too bad to put uh, uh, individuals twice in a machine, although since then we, we now even, even do it three times. Um, but our, our trick was to invite twins, adult twins, here female adult twins without children, and one of them we gave a, a nasal sniff with oxytocin and the other with placebo. And they were interviewed with the adult attachment interview. And what we found was that oxytocin reduced amygdala activation to infants crying and increased insulin inferior frontal gyrus activation to infants crying, which means less anxiety and aversion, more empathy. But we found that it was specifically for those who were insecure in terms of their adult attachment interview. So it downregulated amygdala activation during infant crying, specifically in insecure adults. On the left hand, you see the secure adults, no big difference between blue, which is placebo, and yellow, which is oxytocin. But on the right hand, you see the insecure ones, and there it was a big difference. And also, in terms of their, um, their head grip, we found that for secure participants, it did not make a big difference whether they were in the oxytocin or in the placebo condition, but for the insecures, it did. It downregulates, it normalized hand grip force during infant crying. And that was true, uh, as you see below, for all types of insecure classifications. So, is oxytocin not as little helper? Should we order it and distribute on a wide scale? No. Mm -hmm. It does not work for everyone in the same way. Actually, in a meta analysis, we found that uh, it tends to work better for individuals. Who does need it? Who do not need it the most? It tends to work better for those who have had supportive childhoods. So, in sum, reactions to infants crying are partly shaped by genetics and oxytocin. Forty to fifty percent of heart rate response uh, is uh, can be the variance can be attributed to genetic factors. And oxytocin lowers insecure individuals' negative response to crying. Mm -hmm. And men do respond to infant cry sounds. Not similarly to women, but also dependent on their experience. So let us give them that experience. Time for a brighter note. What about smiling and laughter? That were in uh, Charles Darwin's uh, interest as well in his book on emotions. He also included uh, pictures of laughter and uh, um, stressed the importance of, of that. Uh, he wrote, Everyone knows how immorally children love. <coughs> and indeed, it's, it's always nice to have this sound included in, in the lecture as well for you. <laughs> You can't stop laughing yourself if you can hear this. You mimic the, the laughter. It is also uh, attachment behavior. It leads to proximity seeking. It's evolutionary adaptive. It's a rewarding experience for most parents. So it, they continue the interaction with a child that, is, uh, that shows laughter. But it's not rewarding for all parents. For instance, uh, parents with postnatal depression do not experience uh, much fun in their baby's happiness. And because they're also uh, known to have lower levels of oxytocin, um, we wonder whether oxytocin plays a role in <coughs> the, uh, the brain responses to, to laughter. And we found that that was indeed true. I, when we compared, again, individuals in oxytocin and in placebo condition, we found reduced amygdala activation during laughter versus control sound, similar to the differential response in the oxytocin condition when exposed to crying. But also, did oxytocin increase the connectivity between the amygdala and neural reward regions? So that means reduced stress and increased reward value of infant laughter. 
and thus oxytocin may indeed promote attaching, promote sensitive interaction. So in sum, we've seen that a normal crying curve peaks around two months, that adults with an insecure attachment show stronger reactions to crying, that reactions to infant crying are partly shaped by genetics and that they are affected by oxytocin, but not for everyone in the same way, and that experience shapes the brain also in response to infant uh, signals. And um, I think that infant smiling and laughter may save parents from exhaustion <laughs> in the first six weeks. Thank you. And I thank the support of uh, those who granted our research and uh, Marinus Verijsman, who once was my uh, supervisor, then my colleague, and who was included in most of these studies. Thank you. We have uh, mm -hmm. some minutes for questions or comments. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to uh, make a comment, a question, but if I can, please. I have a question. <coughs> Thank you for your talk. So, um, one generic question is: Have you have you played around with the children of deaf parents? Mm, this is question. one of the first things yeah. that I was surprised. That children of deaf parents don't cry. No, it doesn't work. They move a lot to ask for their attention, but they, they seldom cry. And I was wondering if there is an interesting comparison to be done there. Yeah. I've, it's, a, it's a very good question. And I, I've never um, digged into children of, of deaf parents, but apparently you have. <laughs> and <laughs> you say they, they don't cry as much. They almost don't cry yet, okay. especially in this uh, beginning. So the, the reinforcement uh, loop that you were talking about, yeah. uh, it just it's not viable for them. The cry is mostly instrumental, and because it's instrumental and crying doesn't work, they will learn to move around more. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, in the, um, uh, the picture that I showed you of infant crying, you see that infant cries have also, uh, that, that their faces change, that, that you can see when an infant is unhappy or, or crying. But it's, uh, it's interesting that they learn that the sound doesn't make sense. Yeah. Then I have another question that's more methodological about control sounds. So you showed you showed two experimental designs. One of them had uh, cries and laughter, and there was I noticed that there was no neutral sound. And when you shuffled the sound, it was very very similar to a white uh, bursted white noise, which is inherently aversive. And I wonder if that was taken into consideration when you're analyzing the data. Yeah, you see in the meta-analysis that uh, there is also um, uh, in the auditory. Uh, regions, there is differential reaction to to uh, to the cry sound and the control sound. So uh, it's clear that it's not that, uh, comparable in all in all ways. That the, the the sort of white noise is still a an unattractive sound. I think is good for it should still be not an attractive sound. Yeah, because you showed the in the Yeah. We never compare directly infant cries with infant laughter. Uh, if, if I gave the suggestion, that is not a good suggestion. We always compared cries with control sounds of, control sounds of cries and laughter with control sounds of laughter. Good. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much. It was absolutely interesting. All of you and very informative. The one question that <coughs> I had very early on when you give images of babies crying, that's a visual information, but they also have tears. Mm -hmm. And I know from studies that Noam Sabel has done that tears actually have chemical influence on the receiver and affect them. So I was wondering if you had maybe ever thought about doing something like that, examining actually what is the chemical signal that is being issued by tears 
and what effects it may have on fathers, mothers, caregivers. Yeah. In the Is study where we that? compared faces with tears and without tears, we choose to use faces that were more or less neutral, so that it would not be strange to have tears on them, but they were a bit ambiguous. The, the series of photos that I showed you of uh, crying babies with uh, these expressions, uh, they were simply taken from Google. We never used them in, in our studies. So um, in the studies where we used infant cry sounds, they were not accompanied by facial, by, by visual input, visual stimuli. And in fact, we've only done one study on the impact of tears, and that was the study that I presented to you. Um, and I'm interested to hear more about what you told us about the chemical consequences well, of tears. Tears are chemical products, uh -huh. and chemical signals are the type of odors mm -hmm. that are actually transmitted. Mm -hmm. And they have been shown to have systematic effects on males and females, but this is with adults as far as I know. But that means that you that it would be necessary to work with real infants, I guess. Well, yeah. Real tears. Real <laughs> tears. <laughs> yeah. about infants, but as long as you can collect them, it's not very easy. Ah, yeah, so it, that would be a, uh, a, a smell study. What are the effects study? of the tears yeah, the themselves yeah. uh, as chemical signals? Because obviously they are produced on the specific biological conditions that uh -huh. the person is in and they must have a specific type of quotes for want of a better word meaning mm -hmm. impacting the perceiver so if as long as the perceiver can smell mm -hmm. it probably has an effect yeah yeah that would be very interesting to do a smell study the philosophical question that i would have then is why is that not done? Why, why don't do newborns not have tears? For if it would be helpful or even necessary to evoke some response from the from the adult, it it might help the baby to <laughs> to cry with tears from the beginning. But there must be a specific reason, a function, mm -hmm. yeah. of not having tears for a while, and then evolving the generation of tears. Yeah. I mean, one can say a lot of different things about crying, obviously, as you have uh, outlined. One of them is a signal function. But the tears may also have a function. Yeah, and if they have uh, a, this, this function, if they have the, uh, the, a function, then an alternative, the, 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 there might be two ways to, to address this issue, either is it functional that babies start without tears or could that be a consequence of our being born prematurely so that the system is not yet ready at the moment that we <coughs> come into the world? Well, you can easily do that in the sense that if you collect the tears and you give it, which is what you do in a sense, if you give photos, it is the effect without tears couple the photos, the photos with yeah. others, then you will get both of them and you might be able to get interesting answers. Great idea. Thank you very much. So um, uh, Professor Mary is going to be around for a while. If you any, any of you wanted to make any more comments or questions in a more private uh, <laughs> environment or send her an email, please feel free to do it. And once again, thank you very much to be here and thank you very, very much for your conference and your presentation. It was a pleasure. Yeah.